and so in this uh in <laughs> thank you in this uh process we for example we have learned over the last three years that our partners have generated a tune of over 800,000 US dollars from their income generating projects. And that is roughly around 300,000 in, in the last year, in 2021. And so this provides them the, the, the freedom uh, to choose where you know, the resources need to be invested within mm -hmm. their communities and their organizations. And the other question is around, is the productivity of the community's natural resources uh being maintained or improved uh, and so in this we see aspects of like improved food security due to better management of the environment and we see pieces or around tree planting soil health that kind of ties into the overall community resilience and the household uh, well-being and then lastly uh we look as well at local participation uh, mm -hmm. is it increasing and in participation we actually look at how many people are engaged directly in our partner activities and like for the last year we had over 20,000 people actively participating either through employment or through uh, programs in healthcare in education some are teachers some are, uh, support staff like there's just array of opportunities and possibilities that uh, our partner organizations are creating within their communities yeah. thank you i think that that's such a wide array of things i do have a lot of questions for you but i know a lot of people are joining in right now so welcome again we are right in session and we're really getting and diving deeper into turning more than a buzzword for the word that we've been hearing and seeing everywhere, localization, community-led development, what does it mean? How do we go beyond and actually put it in practice? Uh, so thank you, Dennis. I think you've touched upon a few points. I will say I have one quick question because you just talked about it right now. But what are community leaders really? Do they exist beyond Mama Hope being there? What is it? What, who are they? Can you say that again? I yes. Think Who are bit. community leaders? Ah, yes. Your... Mm -hmm. Community leaders. You know, these are grassroots, uh, could be like grassroots leaders of organizations, could be the circle within uh, the stakeholders they work with. So uh, at a particular organization, a community leader could be the founder, could be the head of, uh, of a certain program within the community. It could be a combination of those different stakeholders. So at Mama Hope, we work directly with like uh, the leaders of organizations that, but we create space, uh, especially around when we do partner visits when we spend a couple of uh, like some time with our partners to learn about their work and listen to them, that we also engage uh, a wide scope of the leadership, not only mm -hmm. at an organizational level, but within the community, at a political level, at a co an activism level, groups within the community. So we get space and opportunity to have conversations and learn how they, uh, they are creating change for themselves and their communities. Okay, then I think that gives a big picture of what we're trying to define. You need a definition to know where you're going, right? So it's, thank you, Dennis. I would love to hear actually, I don't know if we were trying to connect with Dr. Keeley. She should be in the session right now. Um, and I have a few questions for her because she's one of the community leaders that currently is not only leading one of the schools in Tanzania and Mali, but she's also one person that takes on any role whenever you tell her, can we do this? She just believes she needs to do it and she will be there. So I don't know, um, Wambui, are we able to connect with Dr. Keely? Uh, not yet. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll save those questions because there's so many and I think the conversation can go along. Without further ado, I wanna present Giribo Tindwa, who's also in Tanzania, he's been one of, he's always smiling, as you can see, and he's been trying to change and shift the mindset um, of what we call the big global north. How do we actually make it a world that is united rather than global north and global south, right? 
So I would love to hear from you, Gadibo. What is efficient community-led development? Hmm, great question. Thank you. And 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 I'll start with um, uh, with just a bit about Dr. Kilnes. I got to visit Dr. Kilnes, and you're totally right. She's the the perfect impersonation of community-led um, leadership in, in her community. I got to see her school, and she's exactly what you say. She's doing everything around the community. Now, when it comes to effective community-led um, leadership, you, you, I think when you were introducing the concept, you talked uh, about how Mama Hope um, tries to learn and let, understand their partners. Mm -hmm. So that comes from a place of trying to understand uh, the self part of the organization, right? And you're reaching out to the communities that you work with to try and understand what are the, the pressing needs. And I can give you a quick example here. In, in, in Tanzania, there was a time, um, there was a community that didn't have a lot of water. Um, um, an international organization went in. They figured, oh, the biggest problem here is these guys don't have water. So they dug boreholes. They dug up pipes towards their houses. And then surprisingly, a day after launching the program, the villagers act actually dug up the pipes and went and sold them. And so the question was, if they actually needed the water, why would they dig up the pipes and and you know and go and sell the uh, the pipe uh, the water pipes? So I think effective um, community-led development has a component of first getting uh, the decision making, along with their accountability system established closest to the people that are being affected by the issues. And when, when that is missing, then it's not effective and it's not uh, community led. Um, I think Dennis was talking about uh, uh, different concepts here. And, uh, and I think it comes when you, when you when you spoke uh, about trust, it also comes with uh, that level when you define a community led um, uh, champion. And I can look at it from two different perspectives. Uh, we can look at it from the perspective of Dr. Kilines, who's working directly with the communities, but we can look at it from uh, the perspective of people uh, giving support. And I don't want to call them funders or philanthropists at this point. I, I would just say people giving support because then that's what it should be. Um, there has to be that level of comfort in, in the abundance of giving. So um, as human beings, in most cases, we try and retain some power and in that process is when we actually make community-led leadership ineffective, right? Um, I can give you examples. So community-led leadership has to be inclusive, uh, respectful, supportive, and also recognize the, the existing community and the capacity that exists there. So we'll, when an organization goes into a community, you also have to be aware that there is a, um, a capacity that exists there. There's, definitely something that they understand, they know, and your job as, as a support system is to strengthen that capacity that exists. And not that these people don't know anything and I understand everything, so I'm gonna figure out what they need and I'm gonna give it to them. And that's that usually is what backfires. So I think as people offering support, one, we need to understand that we're not magicians, we don't know everything. And um, as we go into any community, it is our responsibility because you hold the power, it is our responsibility to extend a hand and ask the right questions and say, how can we work together and fix this, um, the issues that you're facing um, and show um, a roadmap of how we can all um, be a better community once those solutions are, um, um, are designed for the people that are in the community. I'll stop there for now. I think you've said a lot. It juggled my mind in terms of how do we actually talk of power dynamics? Because that's something we've discussed every day and we don't know what the solution is. But I think just to touch a little bit on that, what, what do you mean we need to be inclusive at the community-led development level? And then how do we ensure that power, there's no power dynamic because there's a lot of power and money. You know, I, I think we've all been on these different calls and you say, okay, I need to say thank you a few more times. I need to smile a lot. So how do you change that, you know, to become, where, how do you make power not be power? And we understand that abundance is allowed for everyone to have, especially mm -hmm. community leaders. But what, in your opinion, what do you think? So 
to respond to your question, I've worked with so many NGOs, so many startups, and one of the biggest advice I've given is that not every funder is for you, right? And what I mean by that is not every hand that has a bag of money is supposed to work with you if it takes you away from um, the priorities of your community, uh, the needs at the, the community level. And we've seen this over and over, you know, we have so many projects that have failed where a lot of money was uh, poured into a project and the community didn't really believe in it. And eventually it actually backfires. So going back to, to the question, I feel like as, as people who, you know, in my former role, my job was to make sure that I find enough organization to give grants away, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, the people looking for grants uh, you know, their fundraising lead, their their job is to look for the money, right? And I In most cases, uh, with Zoom I love technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it does affect how we make decisions. It um, it affects our relationship, and then the power dynamics kick in. And and when you when you meet uh, money where uh, the self reflection is not in the right place, then money is used as a tool to drive the community where it should not be going. Hundred percent agree. This. There's a lot of power held in. I, I see Dennis saying yes and smiling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and yes, that's, I think yes. that's something that's a unanimous conversation, whether it be in Rwanda, Guatemala, Kenya, Tanzania, anywhere in the world, where, where there is money, there's power. And I yeah. think mm -hmm. we need to be able, as our role as Mama Hope, to center back the power where it needs to be with communities themselves and those that are there every day. Um, and I think that's always my biggest inspiration because I know our partners are there every day. They don't take a day of rest. They take a deep breath and just go on to the next task and what needs to be done. Yeah. Um, at least I would love, as I know a few people were not able to see the video that we have shared in the beginning. As I mentioned, uh, when we started, we have a lot of partners at Mama Hope. We have currently 12 partners. We speak different languages. A few of them are actually in Guatemala. And with my little broken Spanish, we're able to communicate and at least drive the change where it needs to be. Um, one of our partners, Sutil J, that has been working to conserve and preserve their Mayan culture for the past 20 years, despite conflict, war, a lot of, um, a lot of unrest, has found a lot of solace in training younger children to be proud of their identity because you must know where you come from to know where you're going, right? Um, so I would invite Onboyi to share that video again. And of course, as different as it is, it is what community-led development is. It takes different shapes, speaks different languages, and it's beautiful. I feel like if we do not have any trouble with internet, then it's not internet, right? It needs to be a few, just like spices on food, there needs to be a few hiccups in Zoom. Oh, great. It's starting to share one way. We can hear some sound, but I personally cannot see the video. Anyone else able to see? Unfortunately, we're not able to see. 
Um, but for the sake of time, we probably will move along because I know we want to be able to hear from Dr. Keeley as well. And we want to talk to Dennis. And there's a lot of things that we want to talk about. And I would love to give some space to our attendees to actually ask questions because I think those will be leading our conversation as we go on to the end of the year. And we want to be able to have a, a clear idea. I think the good thing about what we've been able to achieve at Mama Hope is to constantly question the work that we do so that we are able to tailor it to each of our partners. Um, so I am going to actually connect with, this is the beautiful thing about Mama Hope, is that we adapt to everyone. I'm going to currently call Dr. Keeley on WhatsApp and connect her and let me know if you're able to actually hear her. Um, just give me a second. Okay, and we are ready. Showtime. I think she's still connecting but in the meantime I think I would like to go back and connect with you Dennis because you talked to Gidibo talked about sustainability um, and I know we have a different vision and Mama Hope of what you talked about income generating projects uh, the environment and all these different aspects that we take into account for sustainability can you tell us a little bit about what we mean um, with the investment that we make? Because I think we always say investment. We invest, we don't talk about charity. We're investing. So yeah, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, thank you, Miley. And I think uh, even just before that, I think Gidibo touched on a couple of things uh, which are really interesting. And I think uh, around power dynamics. And I just wanted to share a little bit on that as well, that you know, in terms of uh, community-led development, uh, there is a lot of um, changes that happen in the community, not only at a, at a community level, but a, a personal level, at the household level, national level. And so uh, flexible funding is such a powerful uh, approach within the realm of power dynamics, because I think it kind of encompasses all those dynamics and changes. Uh, you know, what might work today, according to the strategic plan, to the work plans, all the planning in the, back, in the background, things kind of take turns and change. And so if you are not changing alongside, uh, as well as in terms of how you allocate your resources, then uh, the, the impact turns out to be short-lived. So I think in terms of power dynamics, uh, tied to resources, there is, uh, in our space uh, of community development, there is what we treasure a lot as flexible funding. And so back to the question around investment, I think in the business world, you know, investment, you're expecting something in return. You are expecting a return on, on your investment. And that is mostly in terms of money. And what we look at at Mama Hope, uh, we invest mainly two categories of things. And one is around the resources that could be human capital, that could be money, uh, but also the passion. And so from the, from the resource perspective, when we invest in money or um, human skills in supporting, uh, providing programmatic support to our partners, our return in investment is, on the other end is the actual change that is happening in the communities they serve. And the change comes in terms of like health service users or safe deliveries or kids attending school, uh, clean water, access to clean water, and you know, household income. That is the return on investment uh, within uh, the spheres of community development. And then the other aspect of passion, I think we have seen in a couple of, uh, actually all our partners, that even, we, even when in hard times, especially within the COVID, the recently 
I know in some communities still going on, but challenges like that, we see our partners resilient. We see our partners at the forefront with or without funding, with or without the support, they continue pouring their hearts, their time in creating the change in addressing emerging issues and challenges within their community. And this is the type of community resilience at an individual organization and community level that we talk about that we see as a return on investment. So that's what we usually refer to in terms of investment. Thank you, Dennis. I think that explains a lot, um, especially because as you're looking towards the long term, you need to figure out how do you plan C that's going to stay for as long, even when you're not there anymore. That is the main purpose of what we want to do at Mama Hope. How do we sit down, talk to people and understand what they need and really just be kind of the resources so that they're able to create this circular economy. So I think Maybe that's what I captured what you were trying to share, right? Okay, good. So I would love to see a little bit more of what you're saying, because I think sometimes it's simple to talk about it, but it's even easier when you're able to see it. So I know we have a little short snippet of what it actually looks like on the ground, investment for the long term. Yeah. Now off David goes to sustainability. If you're able to create a place where families feel comfortable, people feel comfortable and are joyful enough to do their work, drive change, educate their children, then what more would you ask for? It's exactly what we want to be able to uh, continue, the mission that we have. And I think each and every one of us have this big task. And magically speaking, I think the video brought upon Dr. Kilinis, <laughs> which is, Dr. Kili, can you hear us? I think if we got oh, you. Yes. Oh, good. At this last. This is amazing. <laughs> At last. <laughs> I know. It's lovely to have you. I think you came at a perfect time because we were talking about sustainability. Uh, and income generating projects. If you don't mind putting your little screen just a few inches lower so we can see your beautiful face. Uh, lovely. I had missed you. How are you? 
Who, who says the technology is always perfect? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that is, but do not worry. We had a few hiccups yeah, maybe ourselves. Maybe my internet is not stable. That's okay. Maybe if you want, wish, you can even take your video off. But uh, perhaps for the sake of time, I'm just going to... I had We have so many questions for you, but I'll just shoot one for you in terms of... So that I can... In case the internet is not too good, right? We need to use it while we have it. So again, we have presented Dr. Keeley. Well, you were not there, but we thought about you because you're one of the community leaders we know that's there hitting the ground running. You're thinking of everyone and giving selflessly. And you wanna understand from your perspective, why is it important? What is the importance of community leaders such as yourself? Oh, sorry, can I take uh, the video off? You know, yes. I'm outside the restaurant, so the no, internet is- that is completely okay. Take it off if you wish. Okay, let me try to take the video off and maybe it will be better. Yeah, it's actually much better. I can hear you properly. All right, yeah. May, can you come again out to your question? Yes, I was wondering from your perspective, why is it important to have community leaders? Why are community leaders important, grassroots leaders? Were you able to hear me, Dr. Kili? Oh, again, it is uh, stacking a little bit, but I think I, I heard you. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for, sorry? Yes, I was asking you, why are community leaders important? Okay. All right, uh, the community leaders are important because uh, they're working with the community in the first place. They're working with the community and uh, the community um the the change makers by themselves so if they have got any problem it is the community that is going to oh personally is a bit of a cutoff dr Keeley, i think you let us know if you're still able to hear us once you come back on, because I feel like you were taking us home <laughs> with what you were sharing with us. Um, I think Dennis, you can also speak towards community lead leaders in terms of their importance. I've spoken with your father once and he was literally in a plantain found farm and showing me each of his plantain trees saying, so this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I said, well, I was calling for something else, but then, <laughs> I understood yeah. that his role was so much more than yeah. what I had heard. So why yeah, do you think I, it's important? What, why are communities important? I think one thing I've noticed over time with our partners and especially community leaders, grassroots leaders, is that they are creating change on aspects of community. They have experienced it themselves and they are still experiencing. So uh, the ones that are addressing education issues within their community have had really challenging time from childhood, you know, or positive things about the education that they want to really carry on moving forward. Or if it's healthcare, or if it's access to clean water, you know, these are things they have experienced for really for their life uh, lifespan, basically, uh, and I think with that it brings a lot of passion to the work it brings a lot of connections the social fabric understanding of like how their society works how their culture works how uh, the different stakeholders within the community who does what who do i run to if i need support from let's say politicians who do i run to if it's to do with healthcare policy like they understand all the social fabric and so being at the center of, of change as leaders is very vital and paramount if we are looking at community-led development and uh, sustainability components within uh, the development aspects. So yeah, I think that is very key, um, contextualized yeah. Uh, experiences, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think I still have to come by 
for my plantains too. <laughs> <laughs> that will be the next stop. Right. But without further, you know, I wanted to, I think that gives a whole picture because there's different ways of being a community leader. They're there every day, right? They're basically yeah. at your doorstep. And I think right now we're having so many troubles with internet and I wish I could apologize so many times, but it is actually, I'm thinking serendipitously that it is, this actually portrays what the relationship is that we currently have every time you say with a funder or anyone else that's the power dynamics this is what it is internet is showing us basically i see everyone laughing but i think you're agreeing with me that we are always there's always this distance and we're trying we said okay internet is going to close the gap but then we're not fully able to connect one we said okay we we miss the in person but then when you come you don't speak the same language and then there's this whole back and forth and then internet doesn't work, right? It just does not want to cooperate for some reason. WhatsApp doesn't work and all the other things. So I think Dr. Kili, do not worry at all. Network problems are, I think, at the bottoms of the list and they happen all the time, but they're pretty telling. I think when you want to connect with people, especially in the space of philanthropy and community leaders, these are the problems they, they face every day. It's a sure. bunch of cold emails that sometimes do not ever get answered. So we're hoping that we can get to answer all your questions and feel free to add them in the chat. I can see a few questions and I'm going to address them to some of our panelists here so that we're able to actually start getting some of the guiding points for the future conversations that we want to hold. This will be a series of webinars where we can call into the attendees to actually talk to us. Um, one of the one of the attendees actually talked about what is the most important point to look at for an organization when deciding where to invest uh, your funds. So I'm assuming that's one of the person talking about um, how, for example, Mama Hope does it, but other people in the philanthropic world or whatever else you want to call them, Kidibo. So maybe on to you. How, what do you think organizations actually look like since you've been behind the curtains? What, actually, what is the conversation there? Um, it varies a lot. And I think for more progressive funders, um, the conversation really relies on um, what is the organization trying to achieve. Uh, but if you look back into like, you know, traditional funding systems, the support would come with like milestones, like ABC is what you need to do. And that's what you're supported to do. Right. And that has its own hiccups. I think when Dennis was talking about flexible funding and you know, um, uh, in recent days, we've seen things like matching funding as well to allow communities to be able to um, scale, but also at the same time, build sustainable, uh, sustainable systems for them to grow over time. And I love when Dennis was talking um, about numbers, he mentioned like um, some of the investment that has been done to grantees are, has reaped over, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. That's that's sustainability in the bank, not not in some piece of paper in the shelf, and that's a, a totally different ballgame, right? And um, as as you know, support systems. One of the requirements you'd always ask, hey, what is your sustainability plan? But you know, in reality, are funders really comfortable supporting organization to get sustainable? Because that's technically running yourself out of business. You know, if this organization is able to sustain their operations, sustain their staffing, you know, their programs in the next 10 years and maybe build a reserve for the next 13 years, well, technically they won't need funding for the next couple of years. So um, are we comfortable building those type of organizations? And, and you know, and, and that's the release of power, right? That's the power shift that we're looking for. And I think um, a lot of, um, you know, the power side is still uncomfortable with that. Um, yeah, so I think it's a slow process that's uh, slowly changing, uh, but we'd love to see that changing much faster. I agree. I would love to see it changing tomorrow. <laughs> let's let's hope for, for a faster process, but I think as we go along, this is a process like you're talking about. So we're hoping that we can learn from the mistakes so that we don't fall into them anymore as we go along this journey. I think there was a few questions about decision-making and how, what that means. You talked about matching, I think matching gifts. I know I've seen a lot of campaigns since I'm a fundraiser, where it's for every dollar you give, we're gonna give a dollar to this 
protects and so and so that in the, it's in in the community. I think I often find it problematic because in my mind I'm thinking, okay, one dollar um, is gonna you're gonna give one dollar for each dollar that you get, but you're not sure you're gonna get it. So I, I don't understand where the concept is, um, and I think we have the tendency to bend ourselves to all these different reports and you know ABCs and like you said previously, we get lost along the way. Um, and um, we're hoping that this process changes, we break the barriers. But in terms of decision making, perhaps, what would you love to see changing, Dennis? Yeah, in terms of decision making, I think a, a couple of things have been mentioned already by uh, Gidibo, but I wanted to look at it from, you know, a mama hope perspective in particular, where we uh, view these these decisions in in the lens of relationships, because before you make the decision, you really have to understand what you are deciding about, and for you to understand, that means you need to have listened and really gathered all the information you need to base your decision on. And so, I think one core thing uh, or aspect I want to uh, fall back to is around the listening, and I know. Uh, there are a couple of things that are guiding guiding uh, aspects for Mama Hope in terms of how we make uh, the decisions. And one is always, always the listening part, but also that uh, the decisions we are making or collectively with um, grassroots le leaders are actually embedded in the fact that the organization or the, uh, the group that we are trying to support is actually rooted and is part of the community itself. And I think this is a very important piece um, as well. And so I think those, the, the, I just wanted to highlight the idea of, of listening because you, you, you will be just uh, challenging to make wise decisions if you do not have the right information for which you are basing on to make the decisions. We are all in agreement. Listening takes, it, it, it actually is hard to listen. I know I have children, so I know to get myself listened to it takes a bit of trick <laughs> and into the adult world, it's still the same thing. How do you listen? Because it's something we need to learn every day. Um, there was a question from Baluku Moses who asked, what is the funding criteria and what are the priorities? Um, I, I can speak to Mama Hope, um, funding criteria. We do not have specifically a funding criteria as other, um, you know, as other organizations have. We really are looking for community leaders that are already a part of the community because not only are they held accountable for their actions, they are there every day. We know that they exist beyond whether or not we partner with them. And that is what we truly are looking for. They're people who are there um, they were there even before we got there, basically. And they're there when we are not present. So that is the funding criteria in terms of they are grassroots leaders that are truly rooted in their community. Because I think that is pretty telling the numbers that Dennis was talking about. As we continue our partnership, because we never truly end our partnerships, even if it's not funding anymore, we're continuously learning from our partners. Um, there is a period where um, this funding criteria or partnership criteria changes. Everything needs to change and always shift. And that is important, I think, in philanthropy. In terms of priorities, we say we take a holistic approach because what we've learned with our partners is when we went in for education, they said, okay, well, children need to eat. They're not gonna go to school without food. It doesn't make sense. Okay, then we need to figure out how we're gonna talk about food security. How do we talk about agriculture when you talk about food security? When, how do you talk about energy? How do you put solar panels on the school so that whenever there's a power outage, the kids still have electricity when they're in the dorms? All of these different priorities change, increase or decrease depending on each of our partners. All of our partners are very different. Some of them are in the arts and preservation of culture. Some are in education. Some are rehabilitation centers. There is no particular priority because we think that when you're a community leader, as Dr. Keeley, you're wearing so many hats at the same time, you're just piling them on 
there is no such thing as, okay, I'm going to be the teacher today. You are the teacher, you're the mother, you're the sister, you're the nurse, you're everything at the same time. And so that is truly the vision that we try to embody when we're funding, uh, we're flexibly funding our partners. So I hope I answered your question, Moses. I don't know if there's anything uh, people you would want to share in terms of some of these funding criteria that you've seen around that people would want to consider. I know money is a big conversation starter for a lot of people. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, just to add to your to your point, uh, Mighty, I think in terms of funding criteria, it's kind of a natural step. Uh, and though you say we are focusing on education, uh, you will find that someone is having, or an organization, a, a group or leader has a space in terms of classroom teachers and, you know, learn is happening, but that kind of ties in into the feeding program for the kids and the teachers. So they start on the side, an agricultural pro, uh, project to be able to sustain the school. And maybe they, they are far away from the national electricity grid, so they need to bring in you know, renewable energy in terms of solar systems. So the funding criteria may not be limited because uh, partners or leaders just build on top of a, like layer after layer in trying to address all underlying barriers to access to certain social services. And so uh, Mama Hope approaches it from that lens that, you know, it's not a one shoe fits all kind of solution. It's, it takes time and it kind of varies and, and, and shifts, shift, shape shifting depending on circumstances. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think that, that really, yes. yes, go ahead, Kiribo. No, just to add on to Dennis, I think the approach that Mama Hop is using is, is really centered on the community and, and it's people centric uh, compared to, um, I, I guess having, having criteria would usually be a way to say no, right? You have a list of things, um, check, check, check. If this doesn't check, then this is how we say no. Um, but I think the approach here is how do we uh, find a way to support this community? And that's um, the approach that Mama Hop is using. Having, having visited a lot of NGOs for like, uh, you know, um, diligence visits, if you go in with a lens that you want to see what is not working, you will find plenty. But if you go in with a lens that you want to find the good things that they're actually doing and you want to find a way to help them, you will also be able to, um, to see those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, Anna in the chat is actually asking as well, I think it relates to, to what we were talking about. How can organizations such as Mama Hope amplify deeper the community-led voices in the philanthropic spaces? So I don't know, Girivo, would you like to connect this question to, um, to answer it to Anna? Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things um, Mama Hop or any other organization for that matter that is like Mama Hop can do in, in, uh, in these situations is one, um, I think money is not the only support system that NGOs or startups would need, right? So it's how do you build um, an ecosystem, an environment where uh, this organization can thrive. So um, as um, Miley and Dennis have mentioned, Mama Hop listens. So it listens to the communities, it listens to, to their community leaders. What are the burning issues in their communities? And, and they use those as, as catalysts to design solutions. So any other organization can do that. That we have, you know, we don't have a shortage of issues in communities, right? And as funders, uh, I I know a lot of organizations have their own limitations. Maybe that means stuffing. Maybe that means you know capacity in terms of financial capacity to support organizations. Uh, but there's so many approaches that um, you can use. You can use your influence um, as a funder. Um, you know, um, matching fund was always a, a component where. Um, it unlocks those scared funders when, when it comes to, well, I can't fund this organization. I don't know who else is funding them. So sometimes um, you can give a small ticket to an organization that you trust just so it unlocks this um, uh, other organization. So some of those components can really amplify this organization to get to the next stage where other organizations can take a look at them. So I think there's, there's plenty to do. 
uh, but I think um, as people holding, uh, you know, sitting on the power side, I think it's always important to understand you have to start. You know, it's the same way, um, you know, when you go to a conference, uh, as, as, as the people holding the cards or the power, then you start those conversations. Then you reach out to the community leaders and say, hey, what are you guys doing? Um, how can we support you in your environment? How can we learn from your your issues, how can we build um, better solutions for you or other communities that we're working in? And maybe to, to add to that as well, I think usually change, uh, uh, change, you know, starts with me kind of saying that within the rooms of Mama Hope, I think just this call or this uh, conversation where we have community leaders occupying the spaces of having conversations with uh, all the supporters uh, across the globe is such a unique way of how we amplify community voices, just opening the spaces within our, uh, our environment as Mama Hope, like events like this or conferences. We usually um, host an annual conference for partners and the partners are not only participants, but they are also facilitators of certain sessions within the conference. So, or if we are having events in other countries where we have slots for partners to actually occupy those platforms and speak um, for themselves. So those are kinds of ways, but beyond uh, our Mama Hope structure, we, we, you know, there are possibilities of, you know, engaging other like-minded organizations like you know mama hope has been involved in a couple of like task forces that are within the realm of community development but also outside of it where this is a constant conversation in those spaces and so that kind of broadens the reach and network through which uh, advocacy for community development kind of takes root mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've touched on all the points I was probably talking about. We have just a few questions. I know we're almost at the end and at the top of the hour um, so that we will be wrapping up our session and there's so many things. People are getting riled up and wanted to ask more questions, but not to worry. We're always, you know, within a click, you can actually reach to us, any one of us on all of our platforms. We're very interactive and we want to get this interaction going. A few questions I would love to ask um, that is from the audience. One of them is, as a white woman working in the international development sector, what should my role in the space be? I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I probably could touch a bit on it as a black woman. I don't know if that's something I should say, but um, just, I feel like first, even being aware of the power that each and every one of us hold in different specific spaces and conversation gives us the, the self-reflection of how am I going to approach it? I'm already coming in, the power dynamics is not necessarily just within, um, I guess you would say color, or if you're a Westerner or a person from a low income country, um, there's a lot of different types of power and that's one of it already, but being aware is something important because it gives you the time to go back to the root and go back to the level where you need to be. I know, for example, for me, and not talking about, I guess, in terms of color, I'm an educated person. I have the privilege of being to university. So when I'm in spaces where I know other people have not had that privilege yet, I understand that I need to get to the level where I am because there's a lot of wisdom that I can get and there's a lot of things that I will discover that I would never have the privilege to once I actually try to look at it from their perspective. And I've granted I might never understand it, but giving it a chance is very important. So yeah, I think that would be my take on it is being aware of where you stand is very important because then you're able to expand. Dennis, I see you unmuting. Yeah. I think you want to say something. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the aspect of allyship is really interesting for that question. Um, and I think when we, whenever you, especially in the international or global development sector, we tend to lose uh, the values that are tied to allyship. Uh, you know, it's not a competition. It's not, um, uh, there's a lot of barriers around privilege and all these 
but I think values tied to allyship and identifying how what do you have that you can offer is it questions and we'll refer back to them afterwards and this conversation is going to be ongoing so we really will be actually asking the questions i do want to ask two questions one of them is to gidebo and i guess for the sake of time if you don't mind uh, rushing through it in a way that's concise and then i'll have one last question for our panelists because you took the time to be with us and i'm really thankful for that so first, the question to Gidebo is uh, from Winnie. Actually, I think, oh, she's from Uganda. Most funding organizations always insist on organizations to have built their capacity to a given level. Yet most of the community-based organizations are actually looking for someone to help build that capacity instead. How does Mama Hope go about it? Um, but for example, so say they need organization which have five or more paid staff, yet the smaller organization cannot pay their staff at this point. Everyone is chipping in. What do you think? Well, I think going back to what I said earlier, not every funder is for you, right? Um, um, there are funders that are looking for organizations that are a little bit more sophisticated and maybe the, uh, the level of investment they make would be a bit higher. So an organization that is at, at this lower level where they're bootstrapping to run their programs, you need to find a funder that actually matches you. You need to find a funder that uh, above all gives you more like, you know, capacity support uh, versus giving you financing, right? They're able now to build your team. They're able to build your policies to help you do the right hiring based on the work that you do. And then over time, you will actually qualify for those other funders that would want you to have a system or a team in place or um, you know, uh, qualified professionals to run your finances and all that. So again, um, to answer your question, I think it's simply this, this is not the funder for you, right? At that stage, maybe that's a future funder for you, but you need to look uh, for a funder that is willing to support you at the, at the level you're at and understand you where you are. And then um, over time, you will be able to reach out to uh, those funders that are looking for more for, more for sophisticated organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, you've captured it in a nutshell, because that is really also the approach we have on Mama Hope. I know some of our partners we worked with, we say they had zero staff members at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's truly they just had family members doing yeah. everything and anything. And mm -hmm. then now they have 300 people doing a lot of stuff and they're at a capacity where they're able to apply for grants or have bigger partnerships. But they really started from ground zero. So it is um, it is a big and heavy load to take on, but you need to be able to search for those few uh, people that are willing to build your capacity to walk alongside you. And it's not just financial, because even if it's financial and then that something else is not coming alongside it in terms of building what's already there and that you have envisioned, then it's just going to be wasted. It would be wasted resources. But to wrap this up, I see Dixon from Tanzania as well, who asked a question. A few more people, I will be responding to you via email. And of course, you can even interact with us on our different platforms or on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, we have it. So you're able, you should be able to contact us at any point in time. And I will make sure to be able to answer your question. But to wrap this up, I would love to hear from each and one of you, because I know this is a a time of day right now it's the evening because I could hear the crickets on your side Dennis, which I miss a lot <laughs> it is time for things to wrap up where do you get your inspiration and motivation to keep doing this work every day do I go fast okay yeah. go ahead Dennis <laughs> you tell and then Please go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I think uh my inspiration it has always been from my own experience um, at so many levels. Uh, as a kid, as when I started getting into the profession, and I think one aspect um, in terms of uh, my own experience is that Mama Hope reached uh, a point, the first time I got in contact with Mama Hope was when our community had tried so many, so many uh, possibilities in trying to raise resources for the work that the community was doing. But we are just outside the structures of, of, of international development, the, the paperwork. 
And this is the organization that took the time to just spend three days, not talking about paperwork, not talking about plans, but just listening what, what we are doing. I think that was a very uh, important aspect or that kind of moves me is that there are always people that are willing to listen to you and that resonate with you, that resonate with your work, your ambitions. And so that hope that that space is there always keeps me going and that we have so many challenges within the globe, but we also have equally have a lot of opportunities and people that are willing to chip in and support our strides. Thank you. I'll connect mine to my day today. So um, I was out in uh, Monduli. Monduli is uh, remote um, from Arusha town. It's like two hours from, actually one hour from Arusha town. Very about, I would say a hundred kilometers, maybe less. Uh, we're doing a case study. I visited a school and one of the teachers were, were just chatting as the uh, our photographer, our videographer was recording the video. And she said, uh, they give porridge to the student at 11. So I asked why, but you're supposed to give porridge in the morning. And she said, some of these kids travel long distances to get to school. And sometimes they don't even have breakfast before they come to school. And if we give them breakfast too early, that is probably the only meal they'll have that morning until the time they go home. And so they move uh, porridge from morning to like 11 because some of those kids would not even have lunch when they go home. So, um, and I think my motivation, why I'm connecting this, my motivation comes from things, I can change things like that. And it, it doesn't have to be um, through financial resources. It could be uh, just a conversation on, on highlighting how can we support this community? How can we make sure, uh, you know, porridge is available in that school specifically? So um, I think my motivation lies in the fact that I am able to do something about this. And, and when, when you see the actual change happen, then you have that satisfaction that um, it's a few things, maybe a few conversations that we've had and we're able to uh, change the life of that child um, attending school. Yeah, I think that's truly inspiring. And I hope it actually inspires so many people that are here and joined us tonight. I personally will say that my inspiration is every one of you, all the partners. I always say to whenever I'm on a call, I'm community strong. So there's nothing that can actually hurt me because I know where I stand and where my truth is. Um, as a Rwandan that had the privilege of going back to her home country after disasters and having uh, a passport, a country, an actual identity, I know how important it is that we support communities to come back to their root because they have so many ideas, so many visions. I know the first thing I did when we were able to go back to my country in Rwanda, we learned a language, we learned my native tongue. And as a person who's a foreigner to learn a native tongue, it opens so many doors that when they tell you, oh no, you need to learn just English and French, because that's the way of the future. And you realize, no, I actually like my native tongue. I like my native name, as strange as it seems. And as many times as I have to actually tell people, no, you say it this way, it is important because it keeps us rooted. And I think that I've seen it in all of our partners. And that is truly my inspiration on a day-to-day, -day, as difficult as the time may be. We say, you know, you bend, but you don't break. And there is mm -hmm. an importance for us to bring back the conversation to where it needs to be. I think we currently are going towards the end of the year and we want to invite more people to put their money where their mouth is, to walk the talk, to actually say no more buzzwords, right? No more giving me this beautiful and fancy uh, digital campaigns. I've seen them all, <laughs> they're very beautiful. But what does it give me at this at this day? You know, I, it doesn't give me much, no pun intended, but I am always looking for more than a buzzword. Where is the actual community behind the word? Because these voices, we all know have faces, they have names, they're people. 
So that is my inspiration. And again, you're all my inspiration. And I'm truly always honored that I'm doing the work that I do. Despite the difficult times, I always end up putting a smile. I always tell Venice, I smiled randomly in the street today. So, and I realize that other people give you back what you give them. So with that being said, I would like everyone to remember that when we think of Mama Hope, we always talk about bringing in people, getting the conversation, because when decisions are made with community leaders, with them, they're not made against them. They're made with them to build for the longer term. With that being said, I thank you, Idivo. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Ambui, for trying above and beyond and being the person in the background with the icon of Mama Hope and making this possible. I'm truly thankful for all our staff members that were able to put this whole work together to be able to bring this conversation to life. But I think we really wanted it to be as free flowing as possible and it couldn't have happened with all of you being there. And Dr. Keeley, despite the internet and the network, I'm very thankful that you were able to join us and you powered through 30 minutes of trying to logging in. So power <laughs> to you and I'm thankful for that as well. On that note, have a lovely evening, everyone. And I hope you will continue to tune in for the conversation because you are truly guiding it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.